Our scripture today is from Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It was on a ship. The captain and the first mate were at odds with each other. The captain and the first mate just couldn't seem to get along. And this went on and the captain was angry and fuming and in an attempt to sully the reputation of his first mate, Several times over several weeks, he wrote in the ship's log, the first mate was drinking today. Well, the first mate got wind of this, and in retaliation, he took a subtle approach, but he chose one day, and he wrote in the ship's log, the captain was not drinking today, leaving it in the permanent record for people to read that and think what they may about the other days all the other days. The captain and the first mate couldn't get along and they stabbed each other in the back. They failed to confront their differences. And the gospel here in Matthew tells us to do otherwise. Jesus commands us to be reconciled. If there's something between you and a member of your community, go to that person and try to make it right. Take the initiative. If you've been wronged, take the initiative to make it right rather than sulking about it. Jesus even says, pray for those who persecute you. When someone in the church has wronged you, the gospel says, take it upon yourself to try to create reconciliation. When you've been wronged, and each of us knows this from experience. When you've been wronged, the worst thing you can do is withdraw. That doesn't make things right. Fred Craddock says it this way, there is no licking of wounds and sighing, poor me, in the Christian community. One cannot always avoid being a victim, but one can always avoid the victim mentality. Jesus is saying that in a Christian community, we are responsible to one another. We have a responsibility to each other, even to those who have wronged us. Whether in person or online, as we are forced to do now, it is in our gathering that God is present with the power that makes forgiving possible. Be reconciled. How? Certainly not by our own power, but by the power of God. Jesus doesn't answer us, doesn't ask us to do this on our own. There was an old Jewish saying that said, If two sit together and there are words of the law between them, then the presence of God is between them. Jesus offers a little different take. He says... Where two or three gather in my name, I am there among them. In saying where two or three are gathered, Jesus is intentionally superseding a Jewish law of that day. In that day, in order to have a legitimate worship service, the law required that you have ten adult males. Jesus didn't require it to be ten, and they don't have to be males. If two or more people can put aside our differences and worship God as we try to do every Sunday, then God in Christ is in our midst. 
God is incarnate in our togetherness. Dr. Richard Seltzer was a physician who wrote a book called Mortal Lessons, Notes on the Art of Surgery. I've shared this with some of you previously, but it fleshes out the truth that Christ has made known in the love that we share with one another. Dr. Seltzer writes, I stand beside the bed where a young woman lies, her face post-operative, her mouth twisted in palsy, clownish. A tiny facial nerve, the one to the muscles of her mouth, has been severed. She will be thus from now on. The surgeon had followed with religious fervor the curve of the flesh, I promise you that. Nevertheless, to remove the tumor in her cheek, I had to cut the little nerve. Her young husband is in the room. He stands on the opposite side of the bed, and together they seem to dwell in the evening lamplight, isolated from me, private. Who are they, I ask myself, he and this wry mouth I have made, who gaze at and touch each other so generously, greedily, the young woman speaks. Will my mouth always be like this? Yes, I say. It is because the nerve was cut. She nods and is silent. But the young man smiles. I like it, he says. It's kind of cute. All at once, I know who he is. I understand and I lower my gaze. One is not bold in an encounter with God. Unmindful, he bends to kiss her crooked mouth, and I so close I can see how he twists his own lips to accommodate to hers to show her that their kiss still works. Because we can know God only through relationship with each other, no human being can survive very long in total isolation without human contact. As part of a scientific experiment, the French scientist Michel Siffre learned this himself by doing the following to himself. This was an experiment where he remained alone in an underground room for many days, 100 feet below ground in Midnight Cave near Del Rio, Texas. Dr. Siffre had all the food he needed reading and recreational material and a certain number of scientific tests to carry out each day. For the first two months, the scientists maintained good physical health and remained well adjusted, both mentally and physically. After two months, however, he began to feel almost suffocated by the loneliness. He started to show signs of physical, mental, and emotional deterioration. On the 86th day, he actually contemplated committing suicide. A week later, he was still hanging on, but he wrote, I am living through the nadir of my life. This long loneliness is beyond all bearing. Commenting on this, Reverend George Maloney says, we will do just about anything to make contact with another living being, especially another human being, in order to establish a sharing community. This burning need to communicate with others is the way God made us so that through communication with others, we might reach some level of communion in love. We have been made by God out of his infinite love to give love and to receive it in return. When this becomes impossible, we become dehumanized. The movie I Am Legend also demonstrates this. The Will Smith character appears to be the sole human survivor after a virus holocaust. His only companion who sustains him through most of the movie is his dog until his dog is killed. And throughout the movie, the Will Smith character has this practice of talking to mannequins. He has a routine at this in the, this ghost town at this abandoned clothing store of going there each day and talking to the mannequins in the store. I know this from my personal experience on numerous retreats, like a church beach retreat, for instance. When I'm alone, 
there by the sea. The ocean, the wind, the sand, the salt water bristling against my face. I feel the power of God. But it is in being with other people, being together in spiritual growth programs, Bible studies, games, jokes, sharing our stories, getting to know each other. That's where I feel the love of God. In the vast expanse of the ocean, I can sense God's power. But it's only in the intimate sharing with others that I feel God's love. Those times have taught me that God is not only all-powerful, but God is also for us. God loves us. But only by gathering can we experience God's love fully. The affection that God has for us. God for us. Coming together reminds us that God has chosen to create us for his loving purpose. God could have chosen otherwise. God has chosen to create us for love. Alone, we cannot fully appreciate this. Only as a community gathered in Christ's name can we fully know Christ's love. It's why the book of Hebrews says, Let us not neglect to meet together, as is the habit of some, but let us come together to worship, to stir one another, to love and to good works. During this pandemic, it's all the more important for us to take advantage of these opportunities to gather with each other online, to remedy isolation. You can, in your head, believe in God as surely as you can look at the grass and believe that it's green. But we're followed, but we're called not just to believe, but to follow Jesus Christ. And following requires commitment and risk. We can't do that alone. You need community in order to follow Christ. If we're together, Christ is present. If we're alienated from each other, whether as a community, as a church, or in our homes, if we're alienated from each other, we are alienated from God. This is why Jesus says, if you're bringing your gift to the altar, and you remember a brother or sister has something against you or someone whom you have something against, stop right there, leave your gift and go and be reconciled with your brother or sister. Then come and make your offering and your worship to God. Anything that alienates us from each other is evil because anything that alienates us from each other alienates us from God. Reconciliation is paramount. Any given week, any of us could say to each other, I don't have to put up with you. I can stay by myself. But you know whom we'd be separating ourselves from? From God himself. If nothing else, perhaps this coronavirus is reminding us how much we need each other. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them, Jesus said. If we don't gather together, whether in person or online, how can Jesus Christ be among us? If we really want to know God, that can happen only in community. I invite you to reflect on God's word and its application to your life.